I was looking at that. I was just like, I was like, I was trying to like, my friend, like, how would I answer this? What are your questions? Like, Google Maps? Maybe do some image I know, you have Yeah, that sounds complex. Yeah, you'd have to get like GIS, you know, some GIS tools. Also, this thing of like, what counts as a parking lot? Also, I'm like, is it a strip mall? Is it. Hello, everybody. 
So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce um, our speaker today. Um, Sid is an associate professor and rodent professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Colorado State University. He received a PhD in electrical engineering from Arizona State University in 2004 with a specialization in electric power systems engineering. He has co-authored over 100 publications in journals and conference proceedings and co-edited edited two books. His recent recognitions include the C. Holmes McDonald Outstanding Teacher Award from the IEEE uh, Ada Kappa Nu in 2017 and the Outstanding Young Engineer Award from the IEEE Power and Energy Society in 2015. Um, so let's give a warm welcome. Good morning. I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks for the invitation. And uh, as you heard, my name is Sid Surya Narayan, and I'm with uh, Colorado State University. And I'm going to talk about uh, smart electric distribution systems of the future. Um, the way I have structured this presentation, uh, based on input from the invitation letter, as I was asked to talk about my career path for 10 minutes. I'll try and do that. It makes me feel old when I'm talking about my career path. I, mean, I've just, I always feel I've just started. Um, then I'm going to hit my research presentation on smart distribution systems. Probably keep it to about 35, 40 minutes, and then we'll go to your questions. Okay. I'm also told that the group is rather eclectic, right? I'm used to talking to electrical engineers, so here and there I throw up equations. Uh, thankfully, in today's talk, you'll see no equations, okay? You might see a typo here or there, but that's always there, okay? So, what did I do? I earned my undergraduate degree in electrical and electronics engineering from uh, Madras University back in India. That was in 2000. Then I immigrated to the United States to pursue my master's in electrical engineering at Arizona State University, Go Devils, um, which I got in December 2001. And I stayed on, finished my PhD in uh, May 2004 from the same department at ASU, different advisor. Um, and then spent the summer looking for jobs. Okay. Um, in, during my PhD, I was working on a project sponsored by the California Energy Commission on trying to deal with uh, a big problem called loop flows in the Western electricity grid. And uh, at that time, it was uh, Governor Schwarzenegger. So I, I have uh, a, a trivia or something that I like to think is cool, which is um, when we had to submit the final report to the CEC, it was just my dissertation. We just slapped a different cover on it and sent it as a technical report. And it was ratified by the governor and was signed by Schwarzenegger, and the PDF was on CEC's website for a long time. So hey, he signed my um, dissertation. Not only that, the governor of Arizona at the time I graduated was Janet Napolitano, so she signed my diploma. So, hey, there you go. I got connections. Huh? Uh, anyway, while I was doing my PhD, uh, I also did the, uh, a training program called uh, Preparing Future Faculty um, based on my interest as well as to earn a fellowship. And that helped me a lot over the period. I started out my professional career as a postdoctoral fellow in the same department at ASU, working on two different projects. Moved in February 2005 to a large center at uh, Florida State University, which was funded by the Office of Naval Research and the Department of Energy. And at, uh, I spent about uh, a little less than three years at uh, Florida State. I was uh, a non-tenure track 
research appointment gave me a lot of degrees of freedom to do things that I wanted to do within the scope of a couple of projects. I expanded my area of interest beyond large transmission systems for electric power systems to small um, power systems that are capable of powering critical loads, be they on the ground or on a ship. So I was involved in designing the power system, the integrated power system for the what was then called DDG-1000, DDX, DDG-51, went through a lot of names. It was essentially an all-electric destroyer for the U.S. Navy. And in, I believe, 2011 or 2012, they floated it. That's called the USS Zumwalt. And it's captained by a person named, named James Kirk. Okay, think about that. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, that was all at uh, Florida State. Then in January 2008, I decided to pursue my tenure track dreams. I uh, moved to a small school in Golden, Colorado, uh, called Colorado School of Mines, a very dedicated uh, engineering school with other programs as well. And I was doing the same things I was doing in the past. When Colorado State University uh, wanted to start a smart grid program, Smart grid is the euphemism for electric power systems of the future. Okay, um, so I was interested in that, and uh, things worked out, and I moved to Florida State, uh, so, so Colorado State University, in August 2010, where I've stayed till now. Became an associate professor a few years ago, and that's where I am. If you look at how my research has evolved. Prior to 2005, my master's research, my master's thesis, was in the area of uh, electric power systems protection. So fun area, but not my cup of tea. Okay. Then I moved on to work closely on topics of uh, loop flows, which is large transmission system uh, issue. Then. Uh, dynamic voltage restorers and distributed generators. I've used uh, acronyms here without expanding them, but don't worry about it. I won't be using those in my talk again, just to give you keywords. So that was what I was doing prior to uh, going to Florida State. And at Florida State, I picked up my interest in microgrids, which I've sustained for 12 years now. Um, and along the way, in sometime 2008, I started working on smart grid philosophies, technologies, and control um, markets, structures, things like those, which evolved into energy management systems, um, creating test beds, because that's one of the things that's always, uh, um, that, 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 that prevents us from quantifying or de-risking our academic research, right? We can come up with a lot of nice things based on math. I'm not saying math is wrong. But to take it to the next level of tech transfer, if you are unable to demonstrate and de-risk on a test bed, then the industry will not buy it. You can say, all right, I'll take it to the field and test it. Nobody is going to let you test a technology in a critical infrastructure because you could collapse it. Your technology could collapse the the stability of the grid. So test beds are very important. I work on uh, real-time hardware in the loop uh, simulations, which is another skill I picked up somewhere out there at Florida State. And we now have a, a really uh, impressive setup, even if I have to say it myself. Because we are part of a large uh, super lab, is what it's called, real-time super lab, the hub of which is based at Idaho National Lab, includes six different institutions, in the US and in Europe, they're all tied together and they perform real-time hardware in the loop simulation. Question then is, so what? So you've tied a few computers, big deal, right? No, electricity travels at the speed of light. Information travels slower than that between Europe and back, okay? Even between uh, Fort Collins and Idaho Falls. So we are developing fundamental techniques in uh, 
compensating those and reflecting reality. So that's, uh, that's fun stuff. CPS is a, and CPSS, CPS stands for Cyber Physical Systems. It's a National Science Foundation program, keyword, whatever you. Uh, we got our first CPS grant. One of the first CPS grants in energy management from the National Science Foundation in uh, 2010. And we built another S into that. That's the social aspect, meaning how about involving the end user? So far, electric power systems has simply ignored the end user by not taking into account certain aspects of how energy is handled. So we are propounding that. Uh, we use high-performance computing, and we are taking all of that and putting it in our research on smart cities. Not just the electricity infrastructure, but how does it interact with water infrastructure, transportation infrastructure, with food networks, things like those. So this has been the evolution of my research. Uh, I really don't know where this is going. Um, mostly in these topics, I think uh, we are looking at a lot of uh, important challenges in front of us, so I'll be working on this for the next few years at least. Uh, some metrics about my research. Uh, we are lucky to be uh, funded well, uh, over three million between PI and co-PI activities. We have uh, publications that are reasonably well referenced with a H index of 23. Um, my group has uh, graduated five PhDs, 10 master's thesis uh, students, supervised 10 visiting scholars, and currently there are six PhD students engaged in uh, the research. And I'm looking to hire a couple more. And my students are really good. You know, they, they are the ones that do the heavy lifting. And they have been uh, recognized for that. In addition to all that, we also have, uh, the reason Colorado State hired me was to start a program and smart grid, not just the research program, but also a, a teaching program. So uh, we have uh, developed four graduate courses. I'm in the process of developing my fifth graduate course, which if any of you is considering an academic career, keep in mind, course development is non-trivial. Okay? Not because of what you have to do, but because of the paperwork that takes you through the curriculum committees. And so anyway, I am proud of that because I'm now uh, on my fifth graduate course, uh, as well as an online certificate in power and energy systems offered by Colorado State University for practicing engineers. So that's some metrics. Uh, this is something that has helped me a lot. Um, service to my field. I participate mostly through IEEE. IEEE is the Institute of uh, Electrical and Electronics Engineers. Started out as a student uh, member way back when I started my master's, and I uh, was made a senior member in 2010. My technical society within IEEE is the Power and Energy Society. Um, I served them as a former editor of uh, two journals and uh, member of uh, technical committees. Within that, I have also uh, served in the Education Committee, Power and Energy Education Committee. I'm the incoming chair of this committee. It's a high-impact, high-visibility uh, committee of the Technical Society because this is the committee that links research to education in my area. So that, that has helped a lot to get a handle on what students want, what should we give them, and all that. Within CSU, I am the faculty advisor for the IEEE chapter as well as the uh, Honor Society, Eda Kapanu. So that's my career path, okay? And let's move on to the research presentation, right? Global climate change is upon us, no matter what you hear from the other side, okay? And no matter what you hear, the largest contributor to greenhouse gases has been the electricity grid. If you look at it, the grid uses 65 percent, oh, the grid uses fossil fuels for producing 65 percent of its output. That's a lot. Anytime you have a fossil fuel which has a carbon in it and you burn it, you produce greenhouse gases and the grid produced 29% of GHGs and 35% of all carbon dioxide in the U.S. 
I think that's from 2015. But then you might hear other uh, arguments that say, oh, wait, 2015 emissions levels were at 1995 levels, so we are doing good. Actually, we are not. If you think about the details, this has some good and bad. The good is the real dirty source has been replaced by natural gas, which is still a dirty source. It has carbon. It needs to be burnt. It just burns slightly cleaner than coal. Still produces GHG, carbon dioxide. Okay? So most coal has been replaced by um, natural gas, driven by the economics of that fuel, okay? not because we are doing it altruistically. Secondly, there is a decrease in demand for electricity. Is that good or bad? It depends on how you view it. If you're a utility company, that's bad for you. Um, the real bad news about decreasing demand is we've had warmer winters. I come from Colorado. Warm winter means people are losing money. Right? There are ski resorts making business during the winter. And if the winter is warm, not enough snow, not enough powder, people are not making money. So not all of this is good, right? This is particularly bad. Let's look at what has happened around the last couple of months, okay? Hurricanes. I'm not saying this is out of my depth. If I said the recent spate of hurricanes and the frequency and the magnitude of those are related to climate change, I would I'd be talking without the benefit of facts, okay? But what I do know is whenever there are hurricanes, it affects the electricity grid. Let's look at this. What you see in gray, I don't know if you can see the gray from there, that is the normal five-year range of uh, consumption, right, in megawatts. What you see in yellow is what was happening in South Texas when Hurricane Harvey made landfall on 25th of August. This part of Texas lost about, and that's thousands of megawatts, okay, that's a gigawatt. So you're losing about two to 3,000 megawatts of electricity. If you look at the coastal region, it's even worse. Tens of thousands of megawatts of electricity was lost. But over the next week or so, this is the timeline, you can see that they were able to bring it back up, okay? Next, let's look at the power outage in Florida when Irma hit Florida. Okay, I think the landfall was around uh, 10th of September. As you can see, from midnight to 6 p.m. of that day, oh, sorry, 6 p.m. of uh, uh, September 11th, over 62% of the customer base in Florida, not just one part of Florida, all of the state of Florida, was without electricity, 62%. That corresponds to about 6 million people. That's not acceptable, right? However, they were able to bring it back up. Now, here's the real problem. Okay? Not that these two are not. Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico bore the brunt of Irma and had about 50% of electricity, 50% of its customer base lose electricity. And within just a few days, Maria hit. Okay. The infrastructure of the electricity grid in Puerto Rico was not, was not great in the first place. But infrastructure of electricity grids in the mainland is, no, is not that great either, right? This is an old infrastructure. We are still getting barely passing grades from the ACSC, right? American, ASC, American Society of Civil Engineers. Every year hands out a grade to infrastructures, electricity grid. If we get a C, we are happy. Okay? Like my undergraduate course, my students. Uh, no. Uh, so this is, it's worse. Um, on top of that, there is something called, why we're these things happening? Why were they able to pull back their electricity outage numbers back to close to normal, um, whereas in Puerto Rico they couldn't? One, 
a dilapidated infrastructure. Two, there is a, an agreement among utilities in the mainland. So if there is a outage in Texas, then people from Louisiana, utility workers from Louisiana or Arkansas, neighboring states, can be brought in and they can go to work immediately. Not the case in Puerto Rico, especially when you're trying to bring people over when there is no airport, right? It's been washed out. The runway was, uh, was damaged. So by the time we were able to bring people in, look at the damage. That's just one picture. That's a critical infrastructure. The problem with a downed electricity grid is it's not just one thing that's being affected. Everything runs on electricity, okay? If you, want a con if you want your communication systems to work, if you want your hospitals to work, if you want certain other, your gas stations to work, you need electricity. So this is a bigger problem than just losing power. All right, let's keep that in mind and look at some of the challenges that faces. This is the mainland. And you see in, on this picture how the annual average wind speed is measured at 80 meters height in the over land. Anything in blue, red, or purple is good. Anything in yellow and green is not so good. That's the wind velocity. You want it to be way up there like that to get electricity out of those. Look where we have the best profiles. Midwest, the Dakotas. Look where people generally gravitate to living coasts. Our transmission system is already at its capacity. The available transmission capacity, ATC, if any of your engineers uh, are in the cloud, will understand it's a metric that's used as a, a, a rule of thumb for measuring how much more electricity can be pushed over transmission lines. So already we are uh, overloading our grid. So if we put wind turbines here, large big ones, how are we ever going to get those sent to the coast where people live, right? Transmission projects are ridiculously cost prohibitive. They are billions of dollars each transmission line, high voltage transmission line. Then there is the problem of rights of ways. These are scarce. The only people that own rights of ways are the uh, railroad companies now. You can't really ask for a right of way to build a transmission line, even within states. Now, if you're talking about crossing state boundaries, that's not going to happen that easily. Let's say your transmission company has all of that and is going to invest in a multi-billion dollar business. They're not going to take the altruistic angle to say, hey, everybody gets green power. No, they're going to use that money where it makes sense to their stakeholders, which is upgrade, replace, and increase reliability by decreasing congestion relief. So there is a priority, okay? So the big challenge is how do we increase access to electricity that comes to us from renewable energy? There are three challenges I'm gonna put up. Okay, that's the first one. Second, this happens on a daily basis. Electricity follows a load curve, and in early morning hours, the demand is low during Afternoon hours, especially on a hot day, all the residences, commercial uh, facilities kick up their AC units, demand goes up. What you see here is a probability curve like uh, representation, it's a load curve. Um, on this side, you see the variable operating cost, cost of electricity, which is a a reflection on the cost of electricity. Zero for renewables, right? This is variable. How much fuel does it cost to produce electricity from wind or solar once it's installed? Zero. Uh, you have these cheap nuclear and hydros, but they are for providing the base load. We are still highly dependent on coal, but as the demand increases, look at what type of generators are called to supply that load? Petroleum and natural gas. Why? Because 
they can respond fast. Those engines can respond really fast. The ramp rate on that is really quick, as opposed to a coal-fired thermal power plant, which cannot change its output willy-nilly. Uh, forget it for a nuclear power plant. Once you reach criticality, set the output, walk away. You cannot change that. These are the ones that can actually change their output. However, they are they use a dirty source of fuel. Second, I suppose folks from California are aware of this duck curve, right? Comes to us from down the road in Folsom. If you look at this, for California ISO, this is the, the load curve of uh, 2015, 2016, and 2017. There are two peaks. During the midday, when there is, this is a function of increasing solar photovoltaics in the system. As you have more and more solar photovoltaics in the system, during the day, that load dips because you're powering it locally with solar PV-based generation. However, when the sun goes behind the clouds or when it sets, all that load that was deferred is now going to be put on the actual grid, and the ramping is so high, you will have to call in those dirty generators to supply that load. OK? Second challenge, how can I decrease the use of this expensive and dirty generators? The third challenge is grid resiliency. I talked about natural disasters. But there are some other situations or scenarios in the grid. I don't know if you're aware of what happened in Ukraine in December 2015. There was a cyber attack on their power grid, and that brought it down. In 2013, uh, the Metcalf substation in this state, owned by PG&E, had sniper attacks that still unsolved. That was a physical attack. There can be unscheduled maintenance issues. Let's go back to this one. Who says your coal fire power plant that's running cannot fail? The mechanical device, that can fail. And it's not going to tell you when it's going to fail, right? So that's an unscheduled maintenance issue. When that happens, there is a difference between load and supply. Unlike any other commodity, Electricity is the most perishable one. Talk about how a cyber attack. I will in just a second. So your load and supply should be balanced at all times because electricity is the most perishable commodity out there. It's produced, must be consumed within 16.67 .6 milliseconds in this country because our frequency is 60 hertz. In 20 milliseconds elsewhere because the frequency is 50 hertz. If it doesn't, if there is more load than supply, the frequency will start going down, and that's a bad thing. If there is more supply than load, frequency will start straying up, equally bad. So that's why we have to bring in all these dirty generators instead of turning off loads. Now, to quickly answer your question about cyber attacks, this is the electric power grid in North America is the most complex man-made machine. Process that for a second. Not the Apollo mission that put man on moon, not your iPhone, whatever phone you have. The electricity grid is the most complex one because balance has to occur in millisecond time frame using large machines that have inertia in, in, in the second, uh, all the way from seconds to hours. Okay? Now, if I'm a person with malicious intent, and I gain access to the um, supervisory and data uh, control acquisition uh, system, SCADA, I can go turn on and off circuit breakers. Circuit breakers are those protection devices that physically isolate and reconnect parts of the grid to the rest of the grid. Okay, So you can really wreak havoc in the grid if I remove. If I am a malicious uh, intent, if I have malicious intent and I'm a cyber attacker, I go in to the SCADA and I flip the circuit breaker off 
and turn the largest generator off the grid, you're looking at a huge imbalance between supply and load. Now, how big is that problem? It is a problem, but if it's just one such occurrence, the design of the electricity grid is so robust that we use something called an N-1 contingency, which means should things fail, well, take the largest generator or the line, the transmission line with the highest capacity. The design of the electricity grid is such that we design it in such a way that if that line drops due to a lightning fault, or if one of the largest generators has to drop out due to a generator fault, the grid will continue to work like that event didn't occur. This is rolled into how we are designing the grid. We've been doing this for a long time. However, sounds great, right? The most complex uh, man-made machine, N minus one, robustness, whatnot. What about N minus two? If a hacker is really putting his or her mind to it, they're not going to just take out one line. They're going to go in, once they have access, what's stopping them from turning off 20 lines, 40 generators, okay? So that is a big deal. Answer your question? Yeah. Okay. So, which, which is in this uh, discussion, what we are trying to do is come up with resiliency. One of the sources describes resiliency as the ability to anticipate, absorb, adapt, and recover from a potentially disruptive event like the one I just described. The goal is to stop an event from becoming widespread because we have an interconnected grid that has the western grid connected to the eastern grid, connected to the ERCOT, which is the Texas grid in the mainland. How do we stop it from moving across, from cascading? So stop the widespread of that, decrease the severity of the event, as well as the duration. To answer that, the third challenge, how to increase the resiliency, we are looking at new philosophies of topology, things that have not been looked at. Say design, uh, New designs, N minus 2, N minus M. Control philosophies. How do we deploy our assets? These become very important in the context of grid resiliency. Now, this is a slightly outdated uh, picture from the Department of Energy, which says that smart grid can deliver, has a lot of uh, information, including uh, sequestration, clean coal, nukes, wind, solar, market storage, transmission systems, the whole spectrum of electric power systems, all the way from generation to transmission to distribution to end use, including smart buildings and smart homes with wireless capabilities and electric vehicles that can charge and discharge. So this is really the future, right? Um, that is the smart grid philosophy, and I'm really condensing a, a large initiative into those couple of sentences, so bear with me. Smart electric distribution system reside within these boxes. You have your end user and her assets. That's a part of the smart electric distribution system of the future. You have commercial buildings, buildings like these, buildings that are malls, strip malls, what have you. Those office buildings are part as well. Storage. Like I said, electricity is extremely perishable, but then we can only control those types of generators like coal and nuclear, which typically we frown at, we should frown at. And the nice ones like wind and solar, we don't have any control, right? Wind blows when the wind blows. So how do we do that? So storage is an important deal. As of today, there isn't grid-level storage available either. There isn't one storage facility that, well, there might be prototype, but it's not prevalent yet. So that's a big problem. Markets. We have to come up with market structures, market philosophies, market operations that will enable smart electric distribution systems. The electricity system in the United States, the market system in the United States, is partially deregulated. Deregulated means 
uh, it's it's open for competition. Okay, but that stops right at this edge of transmission and distribution. We don't yet have the ability to call or go online and change our supplier to our homes as we want to. Right? I don't know who your local supplier is. For me, it's uh, Excel Energy. If I'm not happy with what Excel Energy is doing, or if I have one outage that lasts 10 minutes or longer, I can't go uh, online and say, I'm done with uh, Excel Energy. I want to now have City of Fort Collins power my home. Okay? We do that with our phones. I was really unhappy with my iPhone. I changed to an Android phone. I can't do that with electricity. Okay? Not yet, but uh, the Dutch are, are, are pioneering something like that. So we need to move data regulation beyond this edge all the way down to that one. And we are working on that. Today, I'm going to talk about just two things. I'm going to talk about microgrids and what is called demand response, the next generation of demand response. How am I doing on time? Yeah, I can. Uh, briefly, though, because I teach an entire graduate course, 16 weeks on that. So uh, deregulation, in the past, electricity infrastructure was vertically integrated, meaning if you were a, let's pick on Excel today. Okay, the, if you were Excel Energy, you owned your generation resource, you owned transmission lines, you owned the distribution assets as well as the contract to supply to an end user. You didn't have to share any of this information with anybody else, so you could game the system. You could wake up one morning and say, oh, all right, I'm charging 17 cents per kilowatt hour for electricity. These people are dependent on me as a supplier, monopolistic supplier. Let me kick it up to 30 cents per kilowatt hour. Are they going to turn off the lights and their heaters? No. So that's a very bad way of dealing with a market. It, it, it precludes any kind of energy efficient, uh, economic efficiency. Deregulation was a result of two main um, laws that were passed, orders passed by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission in 1996, led to the creation of California ISO. Um, these two orders, 885, 886, took the generation assets, information that I might have as a large company like Excel related to my generation, and unbundled that from transmission or any other part. What does that mean? Now that means if you are a small generator trying to access the market, the transmission market to supply to say you, you and I both have to, the big uh, participant like Excel as well as the independent power producer, both have to access the same information at the same time and bid for its use. Its meaning the transmission system's use. Now that's a oversimplification of deregulation. Uh, unbundling certain parts of the grid and opening up the information system has led to a lot of uh, um, advantages. Of course, in 2000 and 2001, here in California, uh, Enron came that deregulation, which was uh, a which provided us with some lessons, which we have since then incorporated in how we deal with deregulation. Does that answer your question? Okay. So today I'll be talking about these two topics. Like I said, I've been working on this particular topic for 12 years now. So it would be unfair to present results related to microgrids, try to take 12 years of work in, in 15 minutes. No. So I'm going to just talk about the generic advantages of that philosophy. Okay, I'm going to give some examples of what's going on in the world and why it's important. This is a newer topic, so I'm going to throw some results and see what your feedback is on that. Okay, two different topics. Let's look at microgrid. A microgrid is a small subset, fully contained, a small subset of the large electricity grid. Meaning, within this microgrid, you will have access to generation, you will have access to delivery systems like feeders, electrical feeders, protection systems so that you don't keep feeding into a fault. 
that might occur, be it a lightning fault if it's an overhead distribution or if it's an animal that has burrowed its way into the insulation of your feeder, uh, which by the way happens quite a lot, as well as distribution system assets. By assets, I mean end user loads. Now, the thing to bear in mind is this may not seem like such a big path breaking phenomenon, right? It was when Edison came up with the Pearl Street Station and uh, put out his uh, system of powering, uh, I think, 16 homes with uh, DC electricity. But then we moved on to AC and we moved on to interconnected systems and all those. Islanding has been, islanding means turning off a breaker and becoming self-sufficient or self-contained subset has always been a no-no according to the utility because one, you're taking business away from them. Two, if you turn off your generators and loads uh, on and off without information, that's going to cause unbalance in the grid. So the utility doesn't want you to do that. However, uh oh, another thing is um, large generators that supply the loads are located far away because they are ugly to look at. Now we are saying we're going to bring generators that are closer to where you and I live. So that's the, the path breaking or, or game changing idea behind this. This particular microgrid is equipped with control systems to function either as a part of the existing grid or by itself as an electrical island. And you can, you can turn off these breakers wherever you want. If you turn the blue, the dark blue ones, then everything downstream of a substation becomes a microgrid. If you turn this light blue one off, then a part of the substation feeder, this feed, a part alone becomes a microgrid. Uh, the, these are still connected to the grid, okay? Now turn these all on, but then you turn this one off, a particular circuit, can be a microgrid, provided it has all the access uh, to generators, storage devices, loads, assets, and control systems. You can even open a facilities circuit breaker and make it its own microgrid. Okay? All the way down to a neighborhood or a commercial facility. All the way up to a substation okay? that has several feeders on which reside many of those homes in the uh, commercial setups. Okay, that's a notional microgrid. Unfortunately, when it comes to electric power systems, things are so big that we have to use these rather prosaic one-line diagrams to explain what's going on. This is where we usually lose our jazzy part of uh, engineering, right? who's interested in just some lines. Advantages of a microgrid is reliability of supply. You have access to local generators, the large generator fails, the transmission line drops, you still have access to that. Provides an avenue for renewable integration. Remember those transmission lines that will never get built from Dakota to California? Well, you can use the nice sun, the sunlight that you get in uh, California to help rooftop PVs. You have the million rooftop PV initiative in California. There you can meet your renewable energy standards. So it provides an opportunity or an avenue for renewable integration. By doing this, you defer investments on transmission lines for utilities, large companies, so they can take that money and invest it in something else that will make the system better, okay? There is something else known as ancillary provision, ancillary service provision. These devices, these uh, topologies can also be used for providing emergency service, frequency regulation, things that are beyond just providing electrical energy. And there are economic incentives for the microgrid user. Lastly, this is a solution for increasing resiliency. Should the large generator drop, should the cyber attack be launched on the main grid, if your microgrid can sense a frequency swing, a frequency swing is essentially a uh, electro, uh, electrical phenomenon by which you know things are not going hunky-dory, disconnect, stay 
sufficient, self-sufficient. When the swing has passed, things have returned to normal, reconnect. The users are in remote off-grid communities. Uh, I actually have a student, a, a PhD student working on developing microgrid topologies for powering hospitals in uh, Papua New Guinea. They don't have access to transmission lines. Second, campus facilities. My own campus has access to, it's part of a microgrid in the city of Fort Collins, Fort Z microgrid project. Uh, military applications. Remember that all electric uh, ship I was talking about, uh, I was working on at Florida State? That's a floating microgrid. It's not connected to any transmission grid when it's out in the sea, right? So it's got, and, and other military applications abound as well. I'm not going in for reasons of time. But this is what is of primary interest, timely interest. Microgrids provide an avenue for recovery from disasters. And I'm not just basing this out of uh, you know, my own thoughts. These are actual examples of microgrids helping in disaster recovery. The uh, Tohoku region Pacific Coast earthquake, Fukushima, in 2011, took out power for the entire city of Sendai. The Sendai microgrid, well, it's called the Sendai microgrid, but the official name is NTT Facilities Microgrid, was able to power the um, hospital there. This here is the a Federal Drug Administration's White Oak Research Facility in Maryland. And this is the Verizon Garden City Center uh, office in New York City. Both of these, along with some campus facilities at NYU and Princeton, were able to tide over the outages caused by Superstorm Sandy. Okay. Lastly, this is news from uh, just two days ago. Tesla was able to put up a solar-powered microgrid for the uh, children's hospital in San Juan. And they were able to power that up. Oh, by the way, Maria is the largest. I wanted to say this on the second slide. It's, it's a sobering statistic. Until yesterday, the 2003 blackout was the most expensive and widespread one um, that happened August 14, 2003 in Northeast United States. Uh, now, Maria has. Uh, overtaken that several by several billions of hours of uh, customer outages. Okay, so millions of people affected for hundreds and thousands of hours. Okay, uh, hundreds of hours. We're still within one eighth of a year, right? Okay. So um, another thing is the situation report from DOE says 73% uh, of Puerto Rico is still without power. And 85% uh, of U.S. Virgin Islands is without power. Microgrids could be a solution. Another thing is you have to think about burying your distribution systems, distribution feeders. Otherwise, you're going to have down poles and uh, knocked off lines. The, so I think we made it clear that microgrids have a lot of advantages. However, there is a need, there are needs in research. We need to focus on how to increase the asset diversity and versatility. If you are completely dependent on just solar power, and if it's going to be cloudy, it's the purpose. Right? So you need to be open to having some asset diversity, be it diesel or natural gas or some other kind of quick ramping energy storage. Uh, you need to have smart and adaptive control. Smart and adaptive, especially if you're connected to the grid, you need to be able to sense an oncoming frequency swing, disconnect seamlessly so that people within the microgrid don't even see a flicker. Okay? Sometimes you go home and you might find the clock on your microwave blinking. That's because there was a momentary stoppage of electricity. Uh, we need flexible dispatchability. Right now, um, we, we don't exercise the entire gamut of flexibility when it comes to dispatching our assets within a microgrid. Metrics and visualization tools. Metrics for quantifying the performance. Visualization for having situational awareness. Testbeds for de-risking and demonstrating its value. 
economics and market participation. Without this, nobody is going to be investing in that. You need to make a value proposition for this. Lastly, you need to have standards and regulation, but this one's really caught fire over the last 10 years, and it's IEEE 1547 family of standards is now uh, it's the go-to document. And the reason I listed these, there are many more topics, but these are what my team is working on, these topics. Okay? Now, quickly changing gears, and I'll finish in 10 minutes. This is the next topic that might provide a solution to those three challenges that we talked about. Next generation demand response. Demand response is nothing new. Demand response is an incentive-based program that utilities offer to end users so that they can defer or curtail their, end, their loads, especially during peak periods, so that the utilities don't have to turn on those expensive, dirty generators. Right? So the utility says, hey, I have to pay $20 for turning on one of those machines, but if I can just pay these guys $6, I, don't, I, I still end up making $14 of deferred savings. So that's a de demand response program. I'm using numbers just to make a case. Uh, these programs, demand response programs, have been around in my own city, for, uh, city of Fort Collins. They've been around since 1985. So it's nothing new. However, they've never been as uh, smart and adaptable as we want them to be. These demand response programs are usually triggered based on system reliability and market conditions. Market conditions meaning there's a lot of natural gas, need for natural gas system reliability. Maybe there is a large coal fire plant off grid. The advantage is you have increased efficiency. You don't have to build large power plants to accommodate those loads. Instead, you're, you're incentivizing people to move out of the system for a short period. Lowered emissions because your natural gas and petroleum fired machines don't have to be turned on. And you have a prolonged availability of traditional resources because you're not overtaxing them. If you have end users who are willing to participate in demand response, your home probably has a load, a total load of five to eight kilowatts. The California ISO is a bulk electricity market. They trade in megawatts and gigawatts every hour. So you are below the noise level at 5 kilowatts to 8 kilowatts. So you don't have a value proposition to enter that market. So that goes out of the, the window because you are not able to participate. It makes it impossible for the individual residents to make some money on this. Uh, further, there is a very interesting study that shows that retail customers, if they perform their actions of demand response without coordination, they can bring down the grid. Okay? So they can increase the volatility in the market because they increase price elasticity of demand. So this is an economic concept. It, it, it can backfire. There's something known as a backlash effect. Uh, if you provide demand response and there is a large contingent of electric vehicles and they all take the demand response incentive and say, hey, I'm not going to charge between 6 p.m. and 8 p.m. The system peak passes. Now everybody connects at 8 p.m. They actually shoot the system peak over what was expected at 6 p.m., so it's a backlash. Um, those are not good. So we need to control residential loads to provide a large portfolio. What's missing is market structures and other uh, enablers. We proposed a, a market structure that's a cyber physical system, including that of a home uh, with different uh, smart as well as non-smart uh, devices. And uh, the structure enabled by a for-profit entity called an aggregator that can interface between, say, California. So we took the PJM. Uh, we performed studies for data from Chicago. Nothing says we can't do it for California either. So a demand response market that, uh, is, that provides a uh, venue for participation for aggregators. The aggregator is uh, tasked with intelligently coordinating these loads so that they don't end up causing all those havoc situations that I mentioned, while optimizing its own profit. There must be an incentive for this guy to participate. Otherwise, you're not going to get anything out of that. Lastly. 
the, the goal is to reduce the system peak load. We proposed an alternative pricing that can reside along with the spot market price as well as the utility price. But at the time we started doing this uh, research on alternative pricing and aggregators, there was a Federal Energy Regulatory Commission order called 745 that was uh, being um, sued by the Electric Power Suppliers Association. And whenever we, we used to submit to any large agency the idea of alternative pricing, the agency would come back or a review would come back saying, ah, it's going to be thrown down anyway, uh, down the train because the Supreme Court's yet to act on it. But then in February 2016, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of regulating the distribution, oh, sorry, demand response markets. So now there is a legal framework that allows this type of an enabling technology to pervade the system. So here is a simple example. Well, not so simple. We have 5,555 customers uh, with about 56,000 loads, one third of which is schedulable. No uh, PVs, no energy storage, no electric vehicles. Keep that in mind. We modeled the customer behavior. I'm not going to get into it. I'm just going to say it's non-trivial because it involves a lot of uh, uh, statistics-based mathematics. Then we used a high-performance computer environment because this type of uh, simulation chokes up your laptop. It did mine anyway. Um, we used real pricing data from PJM and ComEd. PJM is Pennsylvania, Jersey, Maryland. ComEd is the Chicago utility. Don't ask me why, but Chicago participates in PJM. And nowhere near Pennsylvania, Jersey, or Maryland. It's through an agreement. So what you see here is the incentive, the alternative pricing that we provided is in green. The forecast price is from uh, PJM that's in red, but the actual price from PJM varies as a function of what generators are on and off, unscheduled maintenance, all of those. So we are able to capitalize on that difference and generate profits for the actual customer as well as the aggregator. The customer base over the month of July in Chicago, using that data, uh, the average customer savings is about $4. Uh, the one that's really aggressive makes about $7 savings, and ones that not so aggressive makes nothing. OK, so not a big deal, right? But think about it. How much do you pay for electricity? You pay about $150 to $200 a month, $7 with none of those smart appliances. No PV, no EV, no HVAC. It's just a proof of concept. Even with just simple electrical appliances, you are able to save $7 on the high end and $4 on the average. It only gets better if you start throwing uh, EV and PV, right? Not quite, but I'll get to that in, se in a second. We also quantified this on reducing the use of natural gas machines. We took two natural gas machines in the entire system as our um, go-to ones that we wanted to curtail. The idea is, remember, the second challenge was how do I turn off or how do I minimize the use of expensive and dirty generators, the second challenge, by cutting down the load before DR and after DR. This is the load that changes due to our pricing mechanism. This is the loadability of those two dirty generators. You can see that we have cut down the loadability. This is the timeline. This is for however long that those two generators are on. And this tells you how much of the full loading, 5 megawatts, is it, uh, is it loaded for. You can see the color is also closer to blue. And the width of that is also reduced. So hey. How do we know we did well? We quantified the total reduction in carbon emissions for that month, about 72,000 pounds of carbon dioxide with just those two generators. And those are natural gas machines. Um, average aggregated customer savings for that 5,000 is pretty much what ex we expected. Right? The average customer makes about $4 savings or $22,000 savings. So what happens when I start throwing PVs on those customers? Rooftop. 
this is what happens. This is the blue one is 0% PV, no PV on the rooftop. The yellow is 100% of those homes have PVs. As we increase the penetration of PV, the profit of the aggregator falls. The profit of the customer also falls. That's because there is no energy storage. Why? Whenever there is the opportunity to put a local controllable load on free electricity available from PV, the customer, I, would put it on free PV, free, free electricity, right? So as you see, the, as the penetration of solar PV increases, the number of controllable loads offered to the aggregator for scheduling also drops. That's the reason this happens. So the aggregator is disadvantaged. So if you're an aggregator, what would you do? Well, other than go out of business. You should start investing in centralized energy storage and include that in your customer incentive pricing. That's what we are proposing. So aggregators will now become the ones that own energy storage facilities. So uh, that's where we are. And that is my last slide. As I said, electric distribution systems used to be the most boring, passive part of electric power systems. Not anymore. This is where the smart grid is really being, um, it, it's really uh, where, where it's emerging. Challenges that are facing us in the electricity grid world is minimized access to transmission. We are more and more concerned, we should be more and more concerned about cutting carbon dioxide emissions, and resiliency is front and center for us. We, we all, we're all following the news about the recent hurricanes. That's my one typo for the slide for the presentation. So, Microgrid is a technology whose time has come. In the past, utilities used to be very, very tentative and would shoot down the discussion about intentional islanding, not anymore. Next generation DR has immense value. And what my group is currently doing is taking microgrids and finding ways to make it pervasive, cheap, and flexible. We are looking at how to reconcile new assets like PVs, electric vehicles, in next generation DR. So that's the challenge that's facing my own group. And that's my group, uh, as well as my collaborators. I have to acknowledge the National Science Foundation Award uh, 898 for giving us some opportunity to work on next generation DR. So with that, I think I'm ready to take your questions, if I have some time. Thank you. Demand growth is going down. Demand is still there. Yeah. So what's happening is we are retiring more and more generators, and we are bringing on newer generators. So those keep loading the transmission lines. Demand growth was expected to, say, go at 4% annually. That's going down, meaning it's not at that rate of 4%, but it's going at a lower rate, but it's still growing. People are still moving to places where they want to move. So that's the, the dichotomy there. That's a, a great question. My answer is uh, we are working on, uh, well, okay, let me give you a, a, a non-answer. Your controller has to be smart, okay? 
uh, you bring up a good point. You don't want this to be switching in and out, left, right, and center. You want it to switch out with a certain level of confidence. So that means your instrumentation, your, your ability to process measurements into a decision should all be smart. So we are working on microgrid controllers that do that. I'm, I'm going to go around the table if that's easier. Okay, um, again, another good question, right? Um, utility should get into the microgrid business. Otherwise, they are going to face competition from a source that they have never considered in the past. When it comes to, yes, and, and what is the sweet spot? How many microgrids should we have in a system? Right. And where should these be placed? Those are all topological, um, th those will be answered by topological research, research on where to place these new circuit breakers to island. Uh, the second question was, what about early responder, or, or sorry, what about uh, first uh, adapters and those that can afford it, right? Resiliency is a system good, just like your quality of power. If, it's, if it comes to you really choppy, then your, your machines are going to be uh, malfunctioning, right? We don't get that. It, it, you could be the richest guy in the neighborhood. You'll get the same 4.8% voltage total harmonic distortion. You could be not that person, and you could get the same, right? Because that's the quality of supply. Resiliency is simply like that. Now, uh, microgrid. If the utility invests in microgrid, then they are differing costs from other investments. So that should, in, that should motivate utilities to invest in that. Otherwise, they're going to, who pays for transmission lines in, in the end? End users, right? Because it's passed down to us. Instead, we are going to now bear a portion of that cost passed down to us for building microgrids. So it's, it's a, it, it involves a behavioral change as well. So I don't know if I've answered your question. But it, it's not easy for me to go into those without uh, help from my collaborators who are behavioral scientists as well as economists. So that's why I, I work with them quite a bit. Uh, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about the full range of functionalities of the community uh, aggregator, but uh, it, it could be. So long as the person or the, the entity is aggregating resources and presenting it as a single controllable unit to the bulk power market, and they are able to participate in the market on behalf of the individual, then yes. Uh, I'm in the Department of Engineering, so uh, I would love to talk to people who are who are tuned into regulation um, or policy research. So things from the engineering world can can be moved along, but I don't work on uh, policy or regulation per se.
benefits to having distributed storage. Well, as a transmission side, is it when you said centralized storage, is that the storage or is it actually independent? So, so cost me. Good point. Uh, I know you said you had two questions, so I'll answer that one uh, quickly. When I said centralized storage, I'm talking about centralized, but still at the distribution level. Instead of splitting it and distributing it to every home, where you will still then lose the customer's controllability or the, the controllability of customer assets, because the customer will then have invested in the, say, Tesla Powerwall, and the aggregator then loses that ability. I'm not talking about transmission level storage when I say centralized. I, I should have made that clearer earlier because we don't have grid level storage. We don't have materials that, uh, that provide high energy density and high power density today. So, yes. Correct. The aggregator must have a stake in it. And it from what it's a little too early for me to say distributed storage doesn't work, uh, but we are looking at it. So far, we have quantified centralized storage as a centralized in the distribution system, not in the transmission system, as an as an opportunity for the aggregator to to regain controllability of assets. Your second question. Uh, I am I'm a little skeptical about the widespread use of uh, natural gas. Right now it seems like a lot of, uh, it, it seems economically favorable, but it's still a, a fossil fuel. So we will still face the challenge of uh, emissions when we, when we use that. But if the fuel switch, as you talk about, goes back with back and forth between those two. Oh, and you're talking about onboard, right? Uh, yeah, predominantly I see the natural gas Well, I, it, I have to look into that. I, I think that will put new constraints especially when the projection of demand and all that will change. Uh, I, I have to look into that. Of course, yeah. Because uh, another thing is the, the, right now, we are all like, oh, okay, let's move to electric vehicles. Let's get away from gasoline. Okay, if we can cut down the time to pump or time to charge the battery and make it comparable to your time spent at a gas station, fuel pump. The other thing is right now our road taxes are rolled into our gasoline price. So if we move en masse to electric vehicles, are we going to be driving over more potholes than now? That's, that's a question that I've had for a while. I've been talking to people about it. So the so things are, I mean, we are looking at one small aspect of a large uh, problem here. And I think this like with many other problems, requires the participation of people beyond just one area of expertise. We need, we need more participation from, uh, I, I collaborate with behavioral scientists, computer scientists, we, we need people from policy regulation, those that know uh, things like uh, where the tax money goes and all that. So that's just an example of how 
Harry the problem is. the idea behind that I didn't want to I didn't want I just put up the customer savings going down as well as a representation of where the money is going I mean it's not like uh, the customers savings from the aggregator is going down but the customer still benefits from having the uh, rooftop PV right because now they're able to power their own loads without even considering an alternative pricing because it's cheap and it's free so they, don't, they, they say, I don't even need to, in the past they would have brought, a, I don't know, 20 controllable devices during a certain time of the day as a portfolio to the aggregator for rescheduling. Now, because they are powering it with their own source, that number drops from 20 to, say, 7. So now the flexibility for the aggregator has gone down as a result of increased uh, penetration of a new technology. So the, the presentation is purely the, on the next generation DR that I showed was purely from the perspective of the aggregator. The customer walks home with, uh, with the advantage. Sure. Oh, we could, we could, uh, Electrons and electron, right? So, if you are able to make the best profit, um, bottom line, you could cycle it through PV. You could cycle it uh, using bulk electricity market. If the price is cheap during a certain time of the day, there should be nothing that stops you from charging it and using it later when it's expensive. And if the fork, see, the problem is you are now going to rely on uh, forecast. Forecast of clouds, which is very fickle, by the way. That forecast is worse than wind forecast, right? So if you're not, if you commit yourself to the electricity market to provide some kind of an ancillary service and you depend, you've depended on the forecast from, the, you know, the cloud cover, that will change. And you'll now be left without the source to meet your commitment to the market, which is not good. So, yeah, you have to look at all the opportunities that are available for you to charge and discharge. Nothing says you can't uh, do charging discharging with EVs, provided you don't compromise the battery life of the electric vehicle whose primary use is in transportation. That's the thing that I'm trying to convince all my students. Like, in electric vehicles, primary use is transportation, not grid support. So think about that and apply those constraints in your optimization. I think you had a question and then. Yeah, you talked about the profits that could be acquired from the aggregator without Talk about how the aggregator would interact with either aggregating to uh, No, this happens a day ahead because the aggregator must build a portfolio, come up with the CIP. Like I said, there was one uh, slide where I just, there, the second bullet, modeling customer behavior is non-trivial. That's a set of two IEEE transactions papers, that, that bullet. So it, 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 it's a lot of information that I just glossed over. But there, is, there must be interaction, and that must precede the actual time at which this is being committed to the market. So there is, we, we put up a timeline on that as well. Okay, so I don't know if I answered that question. Yes or no? Okay. It's kind of, it's kind of a follow-up to that question, which is, uh, is your, uh, does IEEE or ISO have a uh, standard or format for data storage? That's, that, you know, IoT devices could use, that EVs could use, that would be able to do streamline 
Well, there we are, we are all working on it. I think uh, the the standard for exchanging data, I think, will subscribe to 61850. Uh, that is the, the go-to standard for substation information exchange. Uh, open ADR, which is the demand response catalog, so to speak, might be the source for finding out the answer to that. Well, the answer lies in, um, in, in not the savings that the customer makes, but in the resiliency that's offered as a result of providing reliable power. You pay, let's say you pay 15 cents per kilowatt hour for electricity out of your socket. Is that what you would pay if somebody said, I'm going to cut off the supply? Meaning, there is another metric called value of lost load. Depending on who you are, whether you are an industry or a commercial site or an end user, you place different value on not having to lose power. Okay, that's, the, that's what should be tapped for presenting a value proposition of these new technologies beyond the first adapters when it comes to pervasive uh, uh, technology, right? So, yeah, problems abound, but we have to, we have to keep thinking about how to sell this. Because there are, we've looked at some advantages, but we, we must make it worthwhile for the customer. Otherwise, it's not going to. But, you, you, you know, one way of uh, thinking about it, we don't have to present it as a dollar value, but as a percentage of savings over the entire year and the ability to participate in the market and control the value of lost load, then you might see a reasonable value proposition emerging from it. Thank you. I enjoyed being here.